Yes, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this online lecture titled Fake News, an Old News Story. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks to Professor Carlo Ginsburg, who agreed to give us this lecture tonight. Professor Ginsburg will explore the phenomenon of fake news or disinformation through the work of Robert Merton, who coined the term self-fulfilling prophecy. Our speaker will also delve into whether and how we can fend off disinformation. But what is a self-fulfilling prophecy? What do we mean by it? According to Merton, it is, and I'm quoting, a false definition of the situation evoking a behavior which makes the originally false conception come true. End of quote. In other words, it is a misrepresentation of reality causing behaviors that end up making this hypothetical reality an actual one, that make it come true. There are two types of self-fulfilling prophecies, those that are self-imposed and those that are imposed by others. The former occur when one's own expectations are the casual factor, the causal factor, pardon, and one of one's actions. The latter occur when the expectations of others are the factor. For anything to count as a self-fulfilling prophecy, a belief must have consequences that make reality conform to his initial belief. Moreover, the actors within the process, or at least some of them, fail to understand how their own belief has helped to create that reality. Because their belief is eventually confirmed, they believe that it had been true from the beginning. At the House of European History, our entire current temporary exhibition, Fake for Real, explores themes where the lines between duplicity and honesty are blurred. And this is done through a series of case studies from antiquity to modern times. And one of the case studies in this exhibition is the donation of Constantine. Tonight, we will hear about the debunk debunking of this forgery by Savala in the 15th century. Tonight's lecture closes a rich program of panel debates and lectures around the Fake for Real temporary exhibition. For the past year or so, through the eyes of historians, neuropsychologists and other experts, we have heard about the tendency of the human brain to let itself be deceived. We have also heard how difficult it is to distinguish fact from fiction, fake from real, myths from reality. We have learned how this means that human beings have been through centuries deceived by their peers and instrumentalized through falsification, disinformation, manipulation, conspiracies, be it to reach political goals or to earn money with fake fashion and artworks. But we have also studies, studied the human capacity to uncover and debunk fakes and forgeries through fact-checking and critical thinking. And who could help us better to sharpen our eyes and minds than Professor Carlo Ginsburg, which I now have the pleasure and honor to introduce. Carlo Ginsburg, born in 1939, has taught at the University of Bologna, at UCLA, at the Scuola Normale of Pisa, and his books translated into more than 20 languages include titles such as The Night Battles, The Cheese and the Worms, Clues, Myths, and the Historical Method, The Enigma of Piero della Francesca, History, Rhetoric, and Proof, The Judge and the Historian, Wooden Eyes, No Island is an Island, Threads and Traces, and Fear, Reverence, Terror, Five Essays in Political Iconography. He received the Abbey Warburg Prize and the Humboldt Forschungspreis. And when he was awarded the Balzan Prize for European History, he was described, I'm quoting, as one of the most original and influential historians of our time. And he was praised for the exceptional combination of imagination, scholarly precision, and literary skill. Professor Ginsburg, I'm therefore immensely curious about how your immense knowledge as a historian and art historian and your life experience of Europe's difficult 20th century will illuminate us tonight. To the audience, I would like to inform you that you can ask your question through the YouTube chat as usual, and that the debate will be moderated by Johanna Urbanek, 
lead curator of the Fake for Real temporary exhibition. This temporary exhibition, uh, which uh, is called the full title Fake for Real, a history of forgery and falsification, can still be visited until the end of January in the House of European History in Brussels. And now I hand over to Professor Ginsburg and I wish you all a very pleasant evening. The question mark in the title of my lecture, Fake News, wishes to convey a critical distance vis-a-vis -vis a phenomenon which, which is too often taken for granted. This sensing ourselves may help us to approach fake news obliquely. I will start from an essay by Robert Merton that has rarely been mentioned in this context. The Self-Fulfilling Prophecy, published in 1948. Merton, one of the most famous sociologists of the 20th century, defined the concept he was introducing in the following terms, quote, the self-fulfilling prophecy is in the beginning, a false definition of the situation evoking a new behavior, which makes the originally false, false conception come true. The spacious validity of the self-fulfilling prophecy perpetuates the reign of error for the prophet will cite the actual course of event as proof that he was right from the very beginning. End of quote. Some biographical data will cast some light on the implications of this remark. Robert Merton was the son of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. His original family name was Skolnik. As a teenager, Having started a career as an amateur magician, he decided to change his name into Merlin, the medieval magician. Merton was a second choice. His first name, Robert, was also a homage to a famous magician, this time a real one, Robert Houdini, originally Eric Weiss. This piece of anecdotal evidence is not completely out of place here. Merton may have regarded, quote, the self-fulfilling prophecy, which makes the originally false conception come true, end of quote, like a sort of magical trick, which he wanted to unveil. It may be recalled that Houdini, in the last stage of his career, was known as the hunter of fake ghosts. At the end of his essay, Merton added a remark in italics, quote, the self-fulfilling prophecy whereby fears are translated into reality operates only in the absence of deliberate institutional controls, end of quote. Today, in the age of the web, these remarks ring a familiar bell. I will try to explore the implications of Merton's notion of self-fulfilling prophecy in different directions, both retrospectively and prospectively. Hopefully, this will cast some unexpected light on the notion and practice of fake news. Gustave Le Bon's uh, Psychologie des Foules is the most influential work ever, ever written about crowds. First published in 1896 by a polymath who never succeeded in entering academia, Psychologie des Foules has been reprinted many times until the present and translated into many languages. Although it is widely considered as one of the founding texts of collective psychology. Its status has remained, especially in France, highly controversial. It is undoubtedly an anti-revolutionary book written by
by a racist author. Le Bon emphasized that his target was, quote, the entry of the popular classes into political life. That is to say, in reality, their progressive transformation into governing classes, end of quote. Then, in a sudden shift, he went on, quote, Today, the claims of the masses are becoming more and more sharply defined and amount to nothing less than a determination to utterly destroy society as it now exists, with a view to making it hark back to that primitive communism, which was the normal condition of all human groups before the dawn of civilization. End of quote. Lebon's shift from popular classes to crowds is blatant. Was it due to a conceptual confusion or was Lebon implicitly suggesting a political strategy aimed to counteract, quote, the threat of the socialism invasion, end of quote? The use of the future tense in a solemn statement like, quote, the age we are entering will be a true age of crowds is ambiguous. Far from announcing an inevitable trajectory, Le Bon was proposing a detailed argument which implicitly aimed to contribute to turn a seeming neutral scientific statement into a different reality. Quote, a knowledge of the psychology of crowds, Le Bon wrote in the introduction to his book, is today the last resource of the statesman who wishes not to govern them. This is becoming very difficult, but at any rate, not to be too much governed by them. End of quote. But the detailed instructions advanced in Psychology de Poul show that its project was much more ambitious. Le Bon aimed, as it has been suggested, to be regarded as the Machiavelli of the age of masses, who teach how to control and to rule the crowds. According to Le Bon, the crowd's distinctive features are, quote, impulsiveness, irritability, incapacity to reason, the absence of judgment and of the critical spirit, the exaggeration of the sentiments and others besides, which are almost always observed in beings belonging to inferior forms of evolution, in women, savages, and children, for instance, end of quote. Crowds are weak, irrational, dominated by contagion. Quote, a phenomenon which must be classed among phenomena of a hypnotic order. Un phénomène qu'il faut rattacher au phénomène d'ordre hypnotique. Is this a description or a suggestion? If you accept the latter alternative, we must conclude that Le Bon was implicitly arguing that the masses should be turned into crowds relying upon, quote, the power of the hypnotizer over the hypnotized, le pouvoir de l'hypnotiseur sur l'hypnotisé, end of quote. This implicit reference to Charcot and his experiences at the Salpetriere, to Bernheimer, to the Nancy School, explain why, according to Le Bon, the role of consciousness in social life was or should be minimal. Quote, Visible social phenomena appear to be the result of an immense, unconscious working, an immense travail inconscient that, as a rule, is beyond the reach of our analysis. End of quote. Le Bon's ultimate political message was clear enough. Quote, Crowds 
are too much governed by unconscious considerations and too much subject in consequence to secular hereditary influences not to be extremely conservative. End of quote. Therefore, crowds, including parliamentary crowds, need a meneur, a leader, since, quote, men forming a crowd cannot do without a master, end of quote. An entire chapter devoted to, quote, the leaders of crowds and their means of persuasion, end of quote, includes passages like this. To make a skillful use of these resources, a leader must have arrived at a comprehension, at least in an unconscious manner, of the psychology of crowds and must know how to address them. He should be aware, in particular, of the fascinating influence, influence of words, phrases, and images. He should possess a special description of eloquence composed of energetic affirmations, unburdened with proofs, impressive images accompanied by very summary arguments. End of quote. In his group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, 1921, Sigmund Freud commented at length on Le Bon's Psychologie des Foules, although he pointed out that its content was not new since it had been anticipated by Scipio Sigele, the Italian sociologist. Moreover, Freud considered the notion of meneur inconsistent with Le Bon's, quote, brilliant description of the crowd soul, end of quote. Brilliant, but also superficial and full of commonplaces, most of them reactionary and racist. In any case, if we, if we read Le Bon's uh, Psychologie des Foules as a political act rather than a neutral, scientific analysis, which is not, its reception becomes highly significant. Le Bon's book was annotated by Lenin and Kemal Atatürk and possibly read by Hitler. Le Bon's admirers included, besides Theodore Roosevelt and Georges Clemenceau, Benito Mussolini. In 1926, being interviewed by a French journalist, Mussolini said, quote, I have read Le Bon's Psychology of Crowds innumerable times, a fundamental work. I often go back to it even today, end of quote. A passage from a speech delivered by Mussolini in Cremona on June 19, 1923 may convey a feeble echo of what he had learned from Le Bon's book. Quote, Io guardo nei vostri occhi che possono guardare i miei e interrogarmi e domando, I look you into your eyes, which can look into mine and question me, and I ask. And so on. This passage was quoted and commented by Kurt Gottkind, the editor of a collection of essays by various authors entitled Mussolini il Fascismo, Mussolini and Fascism, published in Italian and German in 1926, with an introduction by Mussolini himself. Gutkind, at that time a committed fascist, wrote, quote, his gaze, Mussolini's gaze, with magnetic strength, captures thousands of eyes, taking them into the sphere of his will. He pierces those eyes, trying to identify himself with the soul of this or that individual, whose traits, for some reason, had aroused his attention. More often, however, there is a mutual magic involving two entities that cross each other. Sparks spring from this crossing. One of these entities is the mass. It feels the charm of the man because it knows 
that is one of them because it knows that he is its master. End of quote. This kind of bombastic fascist rhetoric is well known, but its metaphors, hypnotism, magic, magnetic strength, as well as its erotic overtones are significant since they point to a language shared by both the observer, Putkin, and the main actor, Mussolini himself. A few years later, in 1932, Emil Ludwig, a German Jewish journalist, published a series of conversations with Mussolini. In reading the proofs, Mussolini changed one of his remarks, la massa ama gli uomini forti, la massa è femmina, the mass loves, the mass is female, into la massa è donna, emphasizing the allusion to Machiavelli, il principe, chapter 25, la fortuna è donna, fortune is a woman. This allusion was part of the liberate communication strategy. In April 1924, Mussolini had published in Gerarchia, the official journal of the Fascist Party, an essay entitled Prelude to Machiavelli. In this short, cursory piece, based exclusively on the prince, Mussolini insisted on Machiavelli's praise of force and contempt for human beings. A contempt he, Mussolini, not only shared, but on the basis of his experience, possibly worsened. In Emil Ludwig's conversations with Mussolini, the teacher of dictators, as Ludwig labeled Machiavelli, surfaced both directly and indirectly. Mussolini told his interlocutor that his own father, a socialist blacksmith, used to read Machiavelli to his children after dinner. Invented or not, the story underlined Mussolini's appropriation of Machiavelli as part of his public image. Once, stated Ludwig, quote, you wrote that the masses are not willing to know, but to believe, end of quote. Mussolini emphatically agreed. More than man's propensity to believe is unbelievable. When I feel the mass in my hands, in the act of believing, or when I mix up with it, and I feel nearly crushed by it, I feel like a piece of this mass. But at the same time, I feel a kind of aversion towards it, like the poet does vis-a-vis -vis the matter he's working with. Does not the sculptor break sometimes the marble in anger, because he feels that he cannot shape it with his hands according to his first vision, sometimes matter revolts against its shaper." End of quote. And then, after a pause, quote, the crucial point is to dominate the mass like an artist. End of quote. quote the logical outcome of fascism is an aestheticizing of political life, wrote Walter Benjamin, the German philosopher and critic, in his famous essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Reproducibility. These words sound like a comment on the passage I just quoted from Emil Ludwig's Conversations with Mussolini, a book which Benjamin presumably read in German a few years before. The subtext of Mussolini's tirade was a comparison, repeatedly advanced by Machiavelli, between imposing a belief over the people and carving a statue from a piece of marble. Obviously, the context in which Machiavelli and Mussolini lived and worked were completely different. Mussolini addressed the mass, la massa, a new phenomenon designated by an ambiguous word, which referred at the same time to physical matter and to humans, an ambiguity which paved the way to the conclusion, dominate the mass 
like an artist. In 1908, Umberto Boccioni, the futurist painter, provided unknowingly a visual equivalent of the gigantic power that Ga Gabriel Tard, the French sociologist, felt approaching in 1899. The image, please. Can you see it? The, the first image of the PowerPoint, please. Thanks. And this updated version of Andrea del Verrocchio's Venetian monument to Bartolomeo Colleoni, the 15th century condottiere. The next image, please. And then the next one, please, a detail. And then the next one, one more detail. I'm oh, not sorry, go back. Okay. Boccioni represented a meneur surmounting a worshipping crowd. A few years later, in 1919, the word meneur, which had been used in a political sense by Hippolyte and made popular by Le Bon, reappeared in an insightful, prophetic portrait of the young Mussolini, written by a top level police functionary. Giovanni Gasti, quote, this effective and incisive writer, meaning Mussolini, this persuasive and lively orator, Gasti wrote, could become a condottiero, a formidable meneur. Questo scrittore efficace ed incisivo, questo oratore persuasivo e vivace potrebbe diventare un condottiero. Meneur temibile. Meneur, condottiero. And then Duce, Fura. The same word translated into different languages conveys a momentous historical trajectory compressed into a few years. This widespread metaphor inspired Thomas Mann's famous novella, Mario und der Zauberer, Mario and the Magician, 1929, an allegory of fascism in which a professional hypnotist named Cipolla subjugates the audience of an Italian seaside resort until the young Mario kills him. Pervasive use of hypnotism as a metaphor of fascism, could be compared to one of those shared social experiences analyzed by Michael Baxendall in his book on Quattrocento Italian paintings. A distinct echo of Mann's novella may be read in the suggestion advanced by Siegfried Krakauer in his book From Caligari to Hitler, a psychological history of the German film, 1946, that Dr. Caligari, the movie character, could be regarded as a premonition of Hitler. Quote, Caligari is a very specific premonition in the sense that he uses hypnotic power to force his will upon his tool, a technique foreshadowing in content and purpose that manipulation of the soul, which Hitler was the first to practice on a gigantic scale. They, meaning the two authors of the film script, Janowitz and Maya, must have been driven by one of those dark impulses which, stemming from the slowly foundations of a people's life, sometimes engender true visions. End of quote. From Caligari to Hitler, from Gustave Le Bon to Hitler, this trajectory would be simplistic. But the impact of a shared metaphor, the crowd leader compared to a, a hypnotist, leads us to the role played by propaganda in 20th century dictatorships. As I've said, 
Hitler may have read Le Bon's uh, Psychologie des Foules, although this is far from proven. But the impact of a shared metaphor, the crowd leader compared to a hypnotist, leads us to the role played by propaganda in 20th century dictatorships, meaning the context in which fake news as an updated version of self-fulfilling prophecy emerged. Le Bon would have been unable to imagine this context, but is it possible to rework his arguments in the age of the web? This question has been raised by Karsten Stage, a Danish scholar, in an essay entitled, quote, The Online Crowd, a contradiction in terms on the potentials of Gustave Le Bon's crowd psychology in an analysis of affective, affective blogging, end of quote. Perhaps we can reformulate the question adding one more adjective, quote, the lonely online cloud, a contradiction in terms? The answer will be no. As David Riesman anticipated long time ago in his book, The Lonely Cloud, a crowd of consumers hungry for commodities of all kinds is definitely not a contradiction in terms. We are living in an era of crowds which share some features with the one Le Bon was both announcing and ambiguously fighting for as a remedy to the threat of socialism. This lonely crowd is hungry not only for commodities, but also for publicity related to commodities, comparable to energetic affirmations unburdened with proofs mentioned by Le Bon. As I argued elsewhere, in the First World War, political propaganda took its inspiration from publicity. Next image, please. Next image from the PowerPoint. This is uh, Lord Kitchener pointing his finger to, I mean, um, people walking in the street. Your country needs you. And this is, as I discovered, the source of this image. Next image, please. A cigarette publicity. pointed the finger, echoed a poster advertising a cigarette brand. In a chapter of Mein Kampf devoted to war propaganda, Adolf Hitler emphatically emphasized that the model for political propaganda should be the advertisement, meaning a kind of communication unconcerned with truth or falsehood. Quote, the people in their overwhelming majority are so feminine by nature and attitude that sober reasoning determines their thoughts and actions far less than emotion and feeling." Unquote. Once again, Hitler was echoing, either directly or indirectly, Gustave Le Bon, who had stressed, besides the feminine nature of the crowd, quote, the astonishing power of advertisements, when we have read a hundred, a thousand times that X chocolate is the best, we imagine we have heard it said in many quarters, and we end by acquiring the certitude that such is the fact. End of quote. A crowd ready to accept, quote, energetic statements not accompanied by proof will be also ready to accept fake news. But is it possible to fight against fake news? At the very beginning of the First World War, the news concerning German atrocities in Belgium, and especially the murder of civilians, were denounced as a falsity by the German press. In a highly significant move, the French government asked a prominent philologist Joseph Bédier, for many years professor at the Collège de France, to counter those 
accusations. Pédier, relying upon notebooks scribbled by German officers, which he analyzed in depth, proved that the news concerning the murder of civilians were authentic. This event can be inscribed in a long history. The political potentialities of philology had emerged a long time before, at least since Lorenzo Valla, the Italian humanist, demonstrated in 1440 that the alleged donation of Constantine was a forgery. According to the donation, Constantine, the Roman emperor who converted to Christianity, had left before his death one third of the empire to the church. Valla disproved the authenticity of the donation on the basis of some blatant textual anachronisms, a demonstration that is traditionally regarded as a crucial contribution to the historical method. However, as I realized some years ago, a crucial passage of Valla's text was missed. The donation of Constantine includes a reference to the do document itself in the following terms. Quote, Reinforcing the page of this imperial decree, donation, by our very own hands, we have placed it on the venerable body of the blessed Peter. Unquote. Here is Valla's comment. Quote, when I was a boy, I remember asking someone who had written the book of Job. When he answered Job himself, I asked the further question of how, therefore, he managed to mention his own death. This can be said of many other books, although it is not appropriate to discuss them here. For how can something that has not yet taken place be accurately told? How can the tablets include something which he admits himself occurred after the burial, so to speak, of the tablets, end of quote. To the best of my knowledge, no modern commentator has paid attention to the sentence, quote, this can be said of many other books, although it is not appropriate to discuss them here, end of quote. But its meaning, albeit implicit, is obvious. Valla was tacitly referring to the last chapter of Deuteronomy 34, 5, 7. Quote, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. End of quote. Even a bold writer like Valla, in the boldest of his words, did not dare to argue that Moses was not and could not be the author of the Pentateuch. Valla chose an oblique strategy, the one that Leo Strauss analyzed in his famous essay, Persecution and the Art of Writing. How many readers were able to read Valla's text between the lines, grasping its hidden reference? We shall never know. But retrospectively, we are entitled to regard Valla's allusive remark as a turning point in the long history of a secular approach to the Bible. Allusive but unambiguous, its implications are self-evident. We must learn to read all kinds of texts between the lines. We must learn to disprove fake news, digital philology as a future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ginsburg, for this fascinating and terrifying, at the same time, reminder of manipulations by the monsters of the 20th century, uh, which now indeed ring a bell when we think about social media. And uh, yeah, uh, certain um, uh, threats that we also find in Le Bon book, which now can be referred to social media and mechanism which uh, govern this online crowd. Uh, you pointed out uh, on something which is also very much present in our exhibition, 
So creativity and critical thought of Lorenzo Varna helped him to actually question uh, what was not questioned by the others, what was not questioned by the crowd. But here we have a certain contradiction between the crowd, uh, so the collective, and the individual. How would you solve this problem uh, in this time and place when we are uh, actually dealing with, with crowds in social media? Uh, would you give us um, some uh, hint uh, how actually this knowledge, this knowledge about history, about uh, big manipulators, uh, charismatic uh, leaders who, who are also responsible for such atrocities, which happened in the 20th century, how we uh, can actually try to defend ourselves for other leaders who want to govern the crowds, the online crowds today? Well, thank you for this very challenging question. Um, uh, I would start from the subtitle of my, of my uh, presentation, meaning an old news story. So, I mean, uh, there is both continuity and discontinuity. So I pointed at continuity because uh, I suggested that, let's say, the political implications of philology as, um, let's say, um, exemplified uh, in a very powerful way by Lorenzo Valla um, had a tradition and actually they acted along centuries. But uh, I mean, this old story um, is also a new one insofar as the technology the technological context is new, not only different, but completely new. I'm talking about the web, which we are using at this very moment. So there is a kind of a self-referential element, if you like. And certainly when I say uh, that digital philology as a future, I said something which is, uh, let's say, I mean, not a detailed program of action. I'm convinced that actually we should, uh, let's say, try to involve people as much as possible in uh, what I called following uh, the definition of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's uh, definition of philology, slow reading. In other words, I think that it's possible to combine the extremely uh, fast speed of the web, of Google, and so on and so forth, with uh, slow reading. This is not impossible. I think that uh, we should start, I mean, uh, uh, but I mean, we should start from the very beginning of, uh, I mean, starting with, uh, I, I'm going to say children. In other words, uh, but uh, the human uh, mediators, in other words, the teachers at every level are crucial. It's impossible to being self-taught for this kind of a sophisticated use of uh, the web by the web. So human mediators should be crucial. And I think that uh, there is a kind of, uh, let's say, like a game, if you like. Um, uh, uh, there is a kind of um, playful dimension for a serious purpose we should be used. And uh, I'm very convinced that, uh, I mean, the schools at every level should act in this direction. It's a different way of reading, um, but uh, obviously, I mean, uh, to ignore the web, it would be impossible, but uh, I mean, the web should not supersede reading and slow reading. And uh, Valla is an example of, of slow reading and, uh, Humbly, I would say that even my reading of, uh, of Valla followed in uh, Valla's foot, footpath. No, I cannot hear you. Um. Okay. Uh, so, um, there is actually a comment uh, on our chat uh, on YouTube. 
um, about um, about those posters um, first used in advertisements, then uh, in in war propaganda. Uh, and uh, one of um, one of the, our our listeners uh, was referring to post truth. Uh, actually, um, is your uh, lecturing going lecture going into direction that uh, we are not living in the age of post truth, or uh, would you say that our era uh, has something uh, distinctive which is different from from the ch challenges of the past? Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, um, even uh, posters are, are uh, let's say, a link in a long chain. And so images are certainly playing a role, um, a powerful role uh, from, uh, from uh, the screen, including our own. So I think that what, what we can learn from Lord Kitchener's poster is something which uh, should be used even uh, uh, when we are dealing with images uh, conveyed by the web. Um, I mean, I'm not an art historian, but I'm fascinated by images and I worked on, uh, let's say, um, uh, famous paintings and so on, uh, in, but also working on, uh, let's say, more popular media like uh, the poster. And um, I'm fascinated by the possibility of interaction of the two levels. And I think that this would also be part of a kind of slow reading because, uh, I mean, uh, looking uh, at an image in order to decipher its uh, sometimes hidden meanings, uh, this also imply kind of slow attitude. Mm -hmm. um, I am I am um, receiving questions from the audience, and another one is referring to the role of the media. Um, the role of the media, uh, which can accelerate the um, dissemination of fake news or slow it down. Um, how would you comment of, on, on it? Well, I mean, uh, okay. Um, I remember that uh, um, Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht um, mentioned a conversation he had uh, with uh, Walter Benjamin when they were both exiles uh, in Denmark, um, uh, uh, I mean, um, escaping uh, Nazi Germany. And um, uh, partly Benjamin said, uh, we should not, not start from uh, good old things, but we should start from uh, bad new things. And I'm, I was deeply impressed by uh, this remark. In other words, uh, bad new things, in other words, uh, uh, things which are used for bad purposes. But uh, I mean, uh, and so I think that, uh, let's say, my suggestion about uh, the possibility of using the web uh, in a way which is different from uh, fake news points uh, at the same direction. In other words, um, we should not be blind to novelty, but we should not, uh, uh, let's say, passive followers uh, of the prevailing use of them. Thank you. And now a uh, more question uh, which is um, rooted in, in, in history. Um, when the individual became a political subject or when the individual became a consumer of industrial products, would you tell us something about the, the origins of, of mass psychology? and its application um, in political action and in commerce? Well, certainly, I mean, um, uh, Gustave Le Bon's uh, book, uh, Psychologie des Foules, um, was a kind of a turning point um, because um, in a way uh, it was reflecting on uh, uh, the past, uh, starting from the French Revolution. Um, and uh, I mean, in fact, uh, Le Bon's book was uh, used and criticized by Georges Lefebvre, the historian of French Revolution, in an essay on uh, uh, full revolutionnaire. Um, so uh, Le Bon was uh, looking at the past, uh, but also, let's say, in a way, he tried to be a prophet, and he was, in a sense. So, I mean, unfortunately. So, I mean, um, I, I certainly have no sympathy at all for his uh, political attitudes, 
but uh, it was a very, very clever uh, observer of what was going on, and he was able to um, elaborate um, the experience he was living in. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, let's say, um, we may use uh, Le Bon's book, as I tried to do, a, as a kind of a threshold a pointing uh, to different directions, the past and the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and, uh... Yeah, no, just one more remark. And actually, I mean, what he said, what Le Bon said about uh, uh, advertisement was very telling. So, um, yeah. Uh, so in a sense, it was, uh, let's say, looking at the future in which, uh, let's say, mass consumption would have been uh, a mass phenomenon. And uh, this is a question which is often uh, or always asked uh, when Le Bon is discussed and his book is discussed. Um, to what extent uh, do you think that uh, the leaders uh, who, who indeed, uh, well, we, we know from, from, from the sources that they were fascinated by, by, by Le Bon's uh, book, uh, but to what extent um, those leaders were using something which was uh, not studied, so they were born with certain, um, certain skills, or to what extent this was studied? We know those famous pictures of Hitler exercising before giving a speech. Uh, do you have more examples of that? Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, let's say um, um, our work, we have more questions and answers uh, in a sense, uh, in insofar as uh, let's say we are looking for more evidence uh, than uh, uh, what is available to us. So we have to, let's say, make uh, conjectures. And I think that, uh, I mean, uh, if uh, historians uh, should not use conjectures, uh, they would be completely blind. Um, uh, but conjectures also ask for proofs. Um, so, I mean, I think that, let's say, um, uh, for instance, um, the fact that uh, uh, Le Bon's book was read by such and such leader is important. Uh, and we can find traces, as I did in the case of uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf, of uh, echoes of uh, Le Bon's book, but uh, maybe indirect echoes. So, but I think the, the hypothesis should be, um, uh, let's say, um, put forward and possibly proven. But um, again, I think that if, uh, let's say one should adopt a kind of black and white attitude. In other words, uh, either something is proven or it should be ignored, we, we would be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, Le Bon's uh, work was also commented by, uh, by publications which appeared uh, in the last years. Um, I am referring here to a, a largely uh, controversial uh, work by Surowiecki, uh, who is talking about the wisdom of, of crowds. And uh, how can we apply this to, um, to the historical context uh, when we uh, are thinking about all those uh, difficult times of the 20th century? We are very much afraid what is coming ahead, uh, whereas uh, there are studies which claim that, uh, well, the crowd uh, has better judgment uh, about what, what can happen uh, and can uh, take actually better decision than an individual. It's just a question, not a statement. Well, first of all, I would say oh, we should make a distinction between context and contexts. In other words, uh, there is a kind of general context, uh, but then uh, there are more specific contexts. And so, uh, let's say the, I mean, to prove that such and such leader, Red Le Bon, um, is something which does not contradict, uh, let's say, the spread of Le Bon's ideas, but it certainly adds something. And then, uh, I mean, I'm very much interested in, uh, let's say, 
reception as a phenomenon. Um, I mean, uh, reception has been studied, first of all, uh, um, about literary texts, but um, I'm interested in reception uh, in a broad sense. And I think uh, what's really interesting is the, uh, let's say, active role played by uh, readers, viewers, political leaders, and so on. There is an interaction. In other words, a text, an image, a message does not act uh, by itself. There are filters and there is an interaction. And so uh, everything is much more complicated than uh, the usual uh, version of interaction uh, admits. So I, I think that this is uh, a topic for reflection. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, question, I believe, and uh, we will see. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, to also quote uh, a comment uh, from from YouTube, uh, which is referring to 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 this very interesting um, comparison between uh, the the uh, the Kirchner uh, poster uh, and uh, what is it uh, what is it based on. Uh, and uh, Peter Schwarz uh, is saying that uh, his first association with this type of look is cinematic, the famous opening closing shot of a cowboy firing a gun at the viewer uh, in Porter's The Great Train Robbery. A piece of cinematic iconography by Fritz Lang picks up in uh, Dr. Mabus Der Spieler. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, then. Um, um, making it shorter, mm. uh, and indeed Hitler's uh, campaign posters very much resembles a famous look into the camera from Lang's film. Um, do we have uh, more examples of of reception of this famous um, famous figure, uh, yes. which is proving to yeah, be so powerful? There are more examples, there are more examples. Uh, um, and uh, I mean, I wrote an essay. Um, uh, which is included in my book, uh, Fear, Reverence, Terror, um, in which I provided more, more examples uh, of the uh, echoes of the reception of uh, Lord Kitchener's poster. Uh, I remember that when I gave a lecture, the essay was still unpublished. I, I was in London and I uh, showed uh, the famous uh, Lord Kitchener's message. And then I said, and now I, am, I, I would like to show you what I regard as the source, and then there was the cigarette uh, poster and said, this is my smoking gun. You know, smoking gun as a kind of, ce qu'on appelle, je crois, en français, les preuves massues. Yeah, so oh, I, I think that, uh, in, effect, in fact, is undeniable also because uh, that, um, I mean, I quoted a, text uh, which was uh, just uh, published a few years before Lord Kitchener's uh, uh, poster, meaning uh, 1914, a, a text about uh, commercial advertisement and a very interesting text in which the author says, uh, it was uh, published in England, saying uh, it's very important to address um, the um, audience uh, saying you. So a kind of personal, uh, relationship. And uh, in fact, uh, this is what the um, uh, Lord Kitchener's poster about. Your country needs you in capital letters. So I think that, uh, let's say, uh, there is this interaction, this um, back and forth uh, trajectory between the publicity, um, uh, uh, political uh, uh, propaganda and then publicity again, still going on, I would say. That poster, I mean, there are innumerable versions of that poster, as you know, I mean, uh, everywhere. Funny enough, uh, this actually contradicts uh, Le Bon's idea about the crowd and uh, collective uh, conscious of the crowd. Uh, because it shows that an individual can be persuaded better if we are uh, talking individually uh, to him or her or um, such an illusion, creating such an illusion. Uh, I don't have 
time for more questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this fascinating lectures. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for their presence, their comments and questions. And uh, well, that was actually uh, the last um, lecture, our last meeting around the fake for real history of forgery and falsification, which can be still seen for only two weeks in Brussels. And um, for those who, who cannot attend, um, I would like to um, advertise also our website and uh, materials which are available online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ginsburg. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.